Hello and welcome to my first topic of presentation, role of glucagon-like peptide 1 in obesity management. This is Dr. Noreen Hawk. I'm a lead endocrinologist and faculty of the University of Maryland, uh, Midtown, and uh, lead endocrinologist and researchers uh, of the obesity management clinic. To begin with, let's start with a case study. A 34-year-old Afro-American female came to your clinic with ongoing frustration of failure to lose weight. She reports to you that she is always a heavy build since childhood and though she has been very active in athletic activity since her early age, she always had been more than 100th percentile of her age matched weight since childhood. Her current body mass index is 38 whereas we know that normal is 18.5 to 24.9 whereas overweight is 25 to 29.9 and then obesity is more than 30 of bmi so definitely she is in uh, class 3 or more in obesity category you have placed her on a strict low calorie diet and she successfully lost only five percent of her body weight over next five months what symptoms in her six months follow-up will you expect Option A, experiencing an increase in hunger that is making it hard for her to continue to adhere to the dietary regimen. Option B, she is accustomed to the low calorie diet and does not have any hunger. Option C, her appetite and hunger pangs are unchanged. Audience, please key in your response. This is the correct answer. Answer A experiencing an increase in hunger that is making it hard for her to continue to adhere to the dietary regimen. Question number two, what are the underlying biological mechanisms that explains her increased hunger? Option A, increased GLP-1 and ghrelin uh, levels leading to an increased pro-opio melanocotin release in the hypothalamus of the brain. Option B, decreased GLP-1 and leptin hormone levels, leading to a reduced POMC or pro melanocortin release in the hypothalamus. Option C, decreased PYY and ghrelin levels, leading to increased NPY, uh, that's another obesity circle, uh, circuit hormone release in the hypothalamus. Option D, increased ghrelin and leptin levels, leading to increased NPY release in the hypothalamus. Please key in your correct answer. The correct answer is option B, decreased glucagon-like peptide 1 and leptin levels, leading to the reduced pro opio melanocortin release in the hypothalamus. That brings the question of GLP-1. What is it? Glucagon-like peptide 1 is a gut-derived peptide secreted by the intestinal L cells uh, after a meal. GLP-1 or glucagon-like peptide has numerous physiologic actions. It potentiates the glucose-stimulated insulin secretion. It helps in enhancement of the beta cell, the pancreatic beta cell growth and survival. It also inhibits uh, the counterproductive glucagon release. Therefore, it, it actually helps the diabetic patients uh, from the uh, excursion of glucose levels by inhibiting glucagon. It helps in uh, delaying the gastric emptying and it helps in reducing the food intake. How is it released in the body? Oral nutrients such as glucose and fat are potential physiologic reg regulators of the GLP-1 secretion. However, hormones, peripheral hormones from the fat cells uh, or adipocytes like leptin has also been implicated in the regulation of this GLP-1 release. Recent studies have begun to elucidate the intracellular signaling pathways that mediate the effects of GLP-1 secretagogues in the intestinal L cell. Um, so how does it cause weight loss? Through activation of the GLP-1 uh, receptor, uh, it actually stimulates insulin secretion after the meal. Therefore, it helps diabetics. But it also has an extra pancreatic action, both in peripheral uh, pathway and also centrally. 
that helps to reduce body weight by promoting satiety and delaying gastric emptying. You must have remembered the question's answer where we said that a reduction of GLP-1 and leptin was actually causing this reduction of pro-opio melanocortin and therefore the hunger pang was starting. Um, so how obesity is a central pathway that, that comes to your mind after like answering that question. Overnutrition or stress cortisol can actually affect in a genetic level, it affects the DNA methylation. Methylation of genetic um, uh, promoters or DNA um, have been associated with dysregulation of multiple hormones. One of the key hormone that can get this uh, demethylated is the pro melanocortin. Uh, what does that do? It leads to insulin resistance, it leads to type 2 diabetes, and it leads to obesity. Please look into my slide where you will see on the right hand side there is a diagram that's showing how uh, corticotropin releasing hormone um, is actually uh, not being effective because Cushing syndrome or stress cortisol had affected the methylation of the potent POMC or pro melanocortin binding site which is called the tissue specific receptor promoter PTX1 how it had the methylated, methylated PTX1 had reduced the POMC level or pro melanocortin level and how a reduced pro melanocortin level has actually uh, led to the satiety, the reduced satiety, therefore the increased food intake. So in other words, reduction of POMC had actually um, shown to have less satiety and more hunger pangs. For example, Children who had the genetic mutation of the heterozygous POMC gene had also had early onset severe obesity and they were demonstrated to have congenital ACTH deficiency. ACTH is the adrenocorticotropic hormone which is subsequently um, going to have the adrenal cortisol production. In genome-wide searches, the region containing the POMC locus is actually linked to the serum leptin level. Again, leptin is a hormone that's coming from the fat cells or adipocytes. And interestingly, there is a genetic predisposition of certain ethnicity. For example, POMC locus had been linked to the fat mass and to the serum leptin level in Mexican Americans and also African Americans and French Caucasians, but it has not actually shown um, any, any relationship to the obesity in Caucasians with juvenile onset diabetic uh, uh, and obesity. So the POMC coding region and the promoter region uh, so, and the variants of this uh, gene were not related to obesity in Caucasians per se, but definitely it was shown to have more link in Mexican Americans, African Americans, and French Caucasians. Coming to the industry of the synthetic GLP-1, is it equally potent? All synthetic GLP-1 that we know, um, namely dulaglutide, um, semaglutide, liraglutide, are they all equally potent in weight control? There had been many studies thus far and it had shown that not all are equal. FDA had approved liraglutide, uh, which is commonly the brand name is Saxenda. Liraglutide 3 milligram had been shown to have proven weight loss uh, with weight loss up to 8.5 kilogram in a relatively short period of time. We have typically seen this uh, benefit of weight loss in uh, six months of trial period. The, the curve started to really like bend and weight loss was shown. However, very, very recently in June 2021, semaglutide 2.4 milligram per week, which is really a high dose, uh, had been approved for weight management by the FDA and uh, it has been indicated as an adjunct to diet and exercise in adults with obesity or overweight. Obesity means the BMI should be 30 uh, kilogram per square meter and overweight is definitely BMI of a 27 kilogram per square meter. Um, so how was it actually officially approved in obesity? The approval was based on the phase three step program, which was the subject of a symposium. The four pivotal trials um, that was led 
like uh, that actually designed that was the part of the step program design was um, step one which was showing examining the weight management in overweight and obese adult step two was to focus on weight management in patients with type 2 diabetes who are not on insulin step three was to focus on weight management with intense behavioral therapy and step four was to make sure that the weight management was sustained Semaglutide actually acts directly in the hypothalamus and the hindbrain to reduce appetite and food cravings, um, pretty much following the pathway that I initially cast some light upon, but still there are many unknown um, as to what other um, neurohormonal peptides is actually affecting. But definitely POMC had been strongly linked. Energy intake has been 47% lower in semaglutide takers compared to the baseline. Um, and the people with obesity across all the step programs, step one, two, three, and four, reduction of body weight, reduction in the waist circumference, and reduction of the systolic blood pressure had been really realized with the semaglutide 2.4 milligram, along with the uh, improvement of overall physical activity. Data from the step three study trial suggested that Semaglutide with monthly lifestyle counseling was sufficient to produce a mean weight loss of 15%. Initial weight loss was accelerated by lifestyle and behavioral counseling components, um, but it did not actually provide additive weight loss uh, after a, a long um, like in intake uh, period, like around weight six, uh, week 68, the weight loss was actually sustained. However, it did show that continuous weight loss and improvement up to the point of week 68. Um, weight loss had been slightly greater in patients without type 2 diabetes uh, than patients who had type 2 diabetes or insulin resistance. Cardiometabolic outcome also was improved in individuals who was treated with semaglutide 2.4 milligram. Mean reduction in systolic blood pressure from baseline was actually 6.2 and 5.6 millimeter of mercury in two different trials. Whereas when compared with the placebo, the reduction was only 1.1 and 1.6 millimeter of mercury in respect. Now you do see that this is huge because 6.2 or 5.6, uh, uh, that kind of reduction can make a patient from stage two hypertension to stage one hypertension or stage one hypertension to prehypertensive stage. The mean change in waist circumference was um, around 9.4 centimeter in patients who had uh, 2.4 milligram of semaglutide weekly uh, versus uh, just less than half of that, like 4.5 centimeter uh, in those who were assigned to placebo but also had low calorie diet and extensive uh, counseling on a regular basis. Weight loss obtained with semaglutide showed definitely a patient to patient variability. Um, for example, 35% of patients actually lost more than 20% of body weight, but 11% low lost more than 30% of body weight. Around 7 to 30%, um, which is really out of 100%, 7 to, 7 to 13% of patients um, lost less than 5% of body weight, but there was some weight loss, um, although not significant. So overall, the superior efficacy of this high dose GLP-1 semaglutide did demonstrate that GLP-1 signaling is a powerful and effective target for obesity therapy. It does provide new clinical opportunity for the control of obesity. And of course, obesity is standing on its own right has multiple medical complications, which I think we should uh, combat with this newly developing and forthcoming GLP-1 analogs. And so does, the, uh, like you know, the researchers say, and as you can see, I have put some sources where you can actually enlighten yourself with more in-depth uh, data from all the step trials uh, that had been published and that had been presented in the American Diabetic Association 2021 um, Symposium. Thank you very much.